I think it's it's fairly well appreciated now that in in the digital era, especially in this kind of um, era of information overload, that our mental lives are probably more fragmented and and can often be more scattered than than perhaps ever before. And there's been a real interest in um, how do we respond to this situation of the attention economy and and so with mindfulness then there's um, just this simple but really important aspect of gathering our attention of um, choosing how we direct our attention what we pay attention to but also the way in which we pay attention that was dan nixon an economist who was formerly of the bank of england and is now part of the mindfulness initiative a policy institute that grew out of a program of mindfulness teaching in the UK Parliament and now works with politicians around the world to help them make mindfulness capacities a serious consideration of public policy. In this far-reaching episode, Dan and I discuss everything from mindfulness and its potential to impact society and the economy, attention as a foundational human capacity, and also how we can apply our attention to its fullest in a world of digital distractions. I hope you enjoy this episode of Digital Mindfulness with Dan Nixon. Dan, welcome to Digital Mindfulness. Thank you so much for being on the show today with us. Um, Your perspective on mindfulness and how it relates to the economy and society is not something that we've had on the show before, so I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So welcome. Thanks very much. Great to be here. So Dan, just take a moment and introduce yourself, if you would. Tell us a bit about your work and in particular how you came to be focusing on the application of mindfulness in society and in the economy. Sure. So I'm a freelance writer and consultant working mainly on the theme of attention and the attention economy and mindfulness in particular Um, and, and, and really looking at questions around the ways that we pay attention as being important, not only for us as individuals, but at a at the level of society as a whole. And I've been leading work on this broad um, theme of attention and society for a couple of NGOs over the last year or so. Um, one is um, the Mindfulness Initiative, and we might talk more about them. And the other is a, a small think tank called Perspectiva. But to think on how I came into this um, line of work. Uh, When I came out of university having studied philosophy and maths, um, I I had no idea what to do with with that degree. And I remember at the time being frustrated whenever I read the newspaper that I really didn't understand anything to do with the economy and economics, but fully aware that it was really important. And so I went and did a master's in economics and I'd, I'd wanted for a while to work in the public sector. And I found myself working as an economist at the Bank of England. And, and I ended up staying there for nearly a decade. But about five years into that period, I, um, I was reading a lot around different um, Eastern spiritual traditions and, and practices such as mindfulness and other forms of meditation. And... I guess I was just really struck personally by um, the worldview underpinning many of those traditions. Uh, For instance, the value placed on simply being attentive and receptive to our moment-to-moment experience, um, or the value in slowing down, actually, and, 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 and putting less emphasis on always trying to do more or go faster. And that broadly less is more kind of philosophy, cliched as it is, really resonated with me as, as making a lot of sense. And in particular, I guess, there was a real contrast between those insights that I felt personally from being less in my head and, and, and more exploring an embodied awareness through, for instance, mindfulness meditation. And the contrast between that on the one hand and my, um, my work, which was the world of economics, the world of um, uh, optimizing consumers and producers and, you know, rational thinking as the methodology to understand economic relationships and so on. And so I wrote a blog post for the Bank of England um, 
on what mindfulness could mean for the future of the economy, um, especially you know, if mindfulness became a, a larger phenomenon than it already is. And another blog post I wrote was on the crisis of attention and how that could link with uh, productivity and, and the slowdown in productivity that advanced economies have seen in the last decade or so. And both of those blog posts received a lot of media pickup. And so I was doing that. And at the same time, I, um, I was studying an MA part-time in Eastern and Western thought, which is essentially just philosophy, but with quite a heavy component on um, things like Buddhist philosophy, Taoist philosophy, alongside in the uh, Western tradition, I was focusing a lot on phenomenology. And doing all of these things, um, I decided around 18 months ago to put my interest in philosophy, in attention, in mindfulness and what all of this could mean at a societal level, um, to put that at the centre of my work. And, and, and I've been freelance working in this area since then. So Dan, tell us a little bit more about the Mindfulness Initiative. What is it and why is it so important? Sure. So um, if we start with mindfulness and, and, and what that is, and, and if we think of mindfulness simply as paying attention to our present moment experience of mind, of body, of our external environment, and doing so with an attitude of openness and curiosity and kindness. And um, mindfulness, as, 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 as we all know, has become extremely popular in, in different spheres of our lives, in workplaces and through healthcare treatment and so on. But with the Mindfulness Initiative, um, it really started with interest among certain members of parliament who were interested to get together to practice mindfulness. And in 2013, they launched uh, an eight-week mindfulness training program where they got some of the best mindfulness teachers to um, take MPs and, 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 and their staff as well who were interested through an eight-week program of simple meditation exercises such as paying attention to um, the sensation of breathing and um, paying attention to sounds and various other standard mindfulness um, practices which help cultivate our capacity to be mindful in other words our capacity to really be present and to be open to our experience and what they found is um, after they'd launched this mindfulness in parliament program and they've had since its inception in 2013 they've had um, over 250 members of parliament and members of the house of lords together have gone through this eight-week program um, from from sort of both sides of the house, and another 350 of their staff have taken the program, and a lot of MPs then became, well, some MPs I should say, became interested in uh, the science uh, behind mindfulness practice and, and the benefits that they were personally experiencing, and also the potential policy implications. And they set up a all party parliamentary group um, on mindfulness to look into the potential for mindfulness in different. Um, walks of public life in education, for instance, or in healthcare, um, or how mindfulness might be used in, in uh, criminal justice, um, and, and, and also in the workplace. And the Mindfulness Initiative then um, started as a group of volunteers to, to support politicians interested in the many um, aspects of mindfulness and really to bridge the gap between those teaching mindfulness and experts in, in, in the um, mindfulness sphere as well as the academics researching about mindfulness and to bridge the gap between that um, body of experts and and politicians interested in how this could be applied in society um, so the mindfulness initiative now does it, it still does the teaching to members of parliament but it does quite a lot of work working with interested ministers and mps and civil servants who are interested in the potential for mindfulness in different spheres of public life Dan, I think these real world applications of mindfulness that you've just been speaking about are really fascinating. And one of the topics that you've written about in depth is mindfulness as it relates to the attention economy. And in particular, how our digital experiences can that we have right now, how they can take away some of our autonomy. Can you explain a little bit more about that and how that works? I think it's it's fairly well appreciated now that 
in in the digital era, especially in, in this kind of um, era of information overload, that our mental lives are probably more fragmented and and can often be more scattered than than perhaps ever before. And there's been a real interest in um, how do we respond to this situation of the attention economy? And um, for instance, James Williams, philosopher at Oxford University, has has written recently about um, the liberation of human attention may be the defining moral and political struggle of our time. And so I guess the way I see this issue around attention and our uh, digital devices, and in particular then the, um, you know, how many competing claims there are to, to grab our attention all of the time and how fragmented we can easily be when we pick up our phone to check the weather, but then we see there's a message and it's so easy to, to get quite lost in, um, in a digital world where often context gets forgotten and your reason for doing something also gets forgotten. Um, and that's a situation I think a lot of people really relate to and have done for a while now. And so there's various approaches to working towards a, um, a, a healthier, or perhaps a wiser relationship with digital technologies. And one approach is to look at the design of the technologies themselves and, um, and, and habits around how we use our digital devices and so on. And that's definitely important. And I think with mindfulness, um, we're approaching it from a slightly different angle, which is from the basic human capacity to pay attention and the ways in which we essentially, although we know it or not, training or developing our minds in certain ways through, that, through our patterns of behavior. And so with mindfulness, then, there's um, just this simple but really important aspect of gathering our attention, of um, choosing how we direct our attention, what we pay attention to, but also the way in which we pay attention. And this is quite a foundational uh, human capacity. If we think about attention not simply as um, something that we have and use to to do something, but attention is the basic thing which connects us with people around us and everything going on in our lives and the world at large. So mindfulness then um, helps us direct our attention in a more purposeful way. And of course, it cultivates that ability in general. So of course, this is particularly helpful in the digital era and the kind of addictive nature and fragmented uh, so the addictive nature of, um, of our technologies and fragmented nature of our attention. But it's also supporting us more generally to, to pay attention on purpose and also thereby to connect with what really matters for us. Because quite often, and, and, and a common, um, simple, everyday mindfulness practice is just to pause with whatever one's doing and take a moment or two just to check in with what's going on, what's going on in the mind, but also what's going on in the body and come into this ground of embodied awareness just for a moment and, and check in there. And by doing so, we can then maybe just ask ourselves, what really matters? What am I trying to do this moment or this hour, this day? Um, and what are my intentions here? And I think this is a way to short circuit what often ends up otherwise being um, a series of distractions or a sort of continuous partial attention approach where we're not quite focused on one thing. And I think there's a lot to be said for just training ourselves and cultivating this capacity to pay attention on purpose. You know, Dan, one of the things that I know that you've written about extensively and, and again, one of the things that you focus on a lot as well in your job um, is the idea of mindfulness as a foundational capacity and you link that very strongly to um, to the attention economy as well. So I think it's a really nice point to lead on to. I'm wondering if you can talk about how these two concepts interlink and also what mindfulness as a foundational capacity actually is. Sure. So this idea for thinking about mindfulness as what we're calling a, a foundational human capacity, it really came about because... Um, the breadth of applications of mindfulness for different target populations and, and, and different intended outcomes became really wide. And as, as, as we've alluded to already, there's 
mindfulness in the workplace for productivity maybe or for um, combating stress and mindfulness in education maybe helps uh, children to kind of keep their attention uh, sustained better and so on but what that leads to and especially as well when the the science um, you know the the scientific inquiry is often as it would be um, focused around what are the specific measurable um, outcomes of of mindfulness practice and all of that's fine but what it leads to then is um, kind of a real uh, quite a scattered set of ideas around what mindfulness is for and what it can do and while a lot of those are extremely uh, helpful by being specific that this population with say chronic pain could really benefit from this program of mindfulness and so on um, I think it's important when we step back and think about our attention and what we're cultivating with our attention in society to think about cultivating mindfulness as something a bit more foundational, by which I mean something which can support our lives in a really general sense, really help us to um, to, to become the person that we each individually want to be and also to create the society that um, we'd like to be part of. So, um, so, so why call it foundational? Well, the first reason is the one that we just discussed, that I think simply paying attention on purpose as opposed to being um, distracted a lot of the time and, and, and having your attention buffeted around increasingly um, is, is one important reason. And one writer on it, on uh, mindfulness, Gunaratana, he talks about mindfulness as simply an alert participation in the ongoing process of living. And I think that quite nicely encapsulates this idea that simply um, you know, participating in our experience in our reality moment to moment is a really important thing to do. The second uh, factor whereby I think it's quite foundational is that there's often this view that mindfulness is something which is practiced by the individual um, for the benefit of the individual. And of course, this is largely true in many respects with regard to the mental health benefits, maybe to one's workplace performance and so on. Um, And it's also somewhat true in terms of the way that scientific studies around mindfulness have so far tended to be focused, which is around benefits and measurable benefits for individuals. But I think this paints uh, just one part of what being present in this embodied way, which is being mindful, is all about. So mindfulness is about paying attention in an open and in a kind way. And if we step back and think, what's the life context for for doing that? And it's that, well, we all live in relationships with other people. We all interact with people. We form part of communities. We form part of the wider fabric of society. And so the way that we choose to direct our attention and the way that we pay attention moment to moment and day to day um, can have a really important impact on those around us. And this sounds obvious, but it comes up in um, in the feedback from uh, sort of participants who've been through various mindfulness uh, training programs that the feedback is so often around people reporting an improvement in their interpersonal relations and um, an improvement in their ability to listen better, to communicate better. And of course, the reason for this is really simple. It's that people become more attentive and they also become less reactive. So if you think about, you know, if someone says something to you and, and, and it triggers inside you, maybe a, a reaction, you feel quite angry and um, quite heated. And when we are caught up in that chain of reactions, it's very easy in our normal default mode simply to maybe make an angry response, maybe snap out and, and say something we might later regret and the situation might escalate. And of course, we see this online as well when you know you see a tweet or you see something which prompts a reaction. And of course, so often it is served to us in ways that really can... Um, promote feelings of outrage and so on. And so there can be a lot of reactivity going on. And with mindfulness, the invitation is just to take a moment to notice what's going on in our own minds and also where we feel that in the body. Just notice 
maybe there's a heat in the chest and bring a curiosity to that. Um, and the key point is that by doing so, that really enables us to, um, to step away from our habitual um, sort of patterns of reactivity and instead respond in the situation, whether it's face to face or whether it's online in a more considered way. So, so, so the second reason then for mindfulness being foundational is all about our connection with other people. And I think that, you know, the findings that are there, and it's fairly early days, I should say, in terms of, you know, the scientific, the robustness of the scientific evidence in this area. But there are studies that show that mindfulness can boost our empathy with one another, our compassion for other people. There's studies around uh, mindfulness practice and reducing discriminatory biases. And in my view, this is really what you'd expect, given that mindfulness is not this, you know, very forensic kind of concentration training, but it's really about cultivating an awareness with this attitude of curiosity and, and what you might call a spirit of friendliness towards our experience. You know, Dan, I've long been fascinated with these concepts of mindfulness and in particular the the ideas that you were speaking about that mindfulness allows this um, allows us to extend the time between the stimulus and the response is is for me is is such an important life skill. But I'm also really aware that the lives that we lead now, the digitized lives that we lead now, don't leave a lot of space for this and actively encourage um, immediate responses to all kinds of digital stimuli. So my next question for you really is from the work that you're doing now with the Mindfulness Initiative and the work you have done also with the Bank of England, what um, opportunities have you seen for um, the real real pragmatic application of mindfulness in society and in the economy so that it benefits us all? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And of course, in a sense, relative to, you know, a decade ago, certainly two decades ago, there's there's a lot of resources um, for people, for individuals and, and, and employees often uh, to access mindfulness training. I mean, some, some digital resources are free and there's apps that people can use and so on. Um, I think uh, going forward, what we're hoping to achieve with this work on thinking about mindfulness as a foundational capacity, really something... Um, for, for, for everyone to engage with if that um, works for them, to, to help them develop as a human being. And if we can frame it as this foundational capacity, as well as, of course, the more specific targeted benefits for specific um, populations with their needs and so on, then I think then we open up the case for thinking about access to mindfulness training as being something like a kind of basic public amenity. So similar really to how you might think about a swimming pool or a library. Um, you might think that access to mindfulness training, quite basic um, programs, should be really widened across society and across you know, different um, age populations and so on. And some of this could be physical. It could be um, investment in you know, public spaces which are designed around uh, kind of declutter if you like and more silence and of course the provision as well of um the development of these mental technologies if you like of, of mindfulness and maybe the other um capacities but also digitally um you know there's obviously a lot of potential for uh, widening access to everyone um so how would you do that i mean obviously to do that would require a program of of um I guess, public investment initially, but there could be um, some sort of public-private partnerships there. And I haven't thought in great deal about you know, this at this stage because we're really at the um, thinking about mindfulness as a foundational capacity um, work is, is really just sowing the seeds here. But you could think about this going forward as maybe, I don't know, maybe the government sets up a, uh, what could you call it, the mindfulness and human capabilities unit say so a self-contained unit a bit like they had the nudge unit for behavioral economics and um you could have a small unit that's looking at how would you roll out if you wanted to cost effectively roll out access to mindfulness training across the population 
different areas um, of the country, obviously. How could we do this in a way that was um, that could be supported by the evidence we do have that would be measured as we go along as to what are the outcomes and are they what we're hoping for? Um, and kind of experiment there with some pilots in that area and, and see, um, see what the outcome was and whether there was uh, interest and kind of evidence to do a, a bigger rollout over the coming decades. Uh, I think um, Yuval Noah Harari in his book, uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, he has this idea that um, you know, so much interest in technology and, and artificial intelligence and so on, but he says that for every dollar and every minute that we invest in artificial intelligence, it would be wise to invest a dollar and a minute advancing our human consciousness. And I think, you know, maybe something like across society access to mindfulness training, which again is simply awareness training, um, could be the sort of thing that aligns with that type of vision for where we want to get to as a society. Dan, we've been talking a lot about the application of mindfulness solutions and policies to society, but given your um, your history, your background as an economist, you've written as well about how these practices can also ameliorate the economy. Can you talk a little bit about that and the different solutions that you brought up in your writing? Certainly. So, I think to begin with, I think um, having some context as to what um, an economic strategy or, 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 or a plan for our prosperity um, needs to fit within. So I guess there's, as I see it, two really foundational challenges that we're facing over the coming decades for, for a long run plan for prosperity. And um, any plan for our economy really needs to be contextualized within within this frame. And the first is uh, the cliff edge that we're facing in terms of our environmental sustainability. And the second is just handling carefully uh, the pace of technological advance, advances in areas like artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things and so on. Um, of course, there's a range of ethical challenges that come with those changes, but also from an economic perspective, there's the automation of jobs and, and so on. And so in the context of these two really big um, changes going on around us, some are calling for a paradigm shift in our economic thinking that places our humanity at the center of that thinking. Uh, the, the economist Jeffrey Sachs is, is one figure who's been speaking out about this. And so if that's right, if we need to think of a more human-centered economy and what that might mean, then... I think mindfulness does seem quite relevant here. So mindfulness is ultimately all, all about awareness. It's paying attention um, to our present moment experience of, of mind and body and our external environment with an attitude of openness and, and of care. And But essentially, it's about awareness, which is arguably our most human capacity of all. And it supports, I think, the development of of uh, qualities of heart and mind that perhaps we really need at this time. So that's kind of the bit of background, but to, to, to explore this a bit more um, substantively then, if we imagine a scenario in which, um, let's say through a public program of investment, that access to mindfulness training was really widened across the population as a whole, and that that gave rise over the next, say five to 10 years to um, a significant uplift in the aggregate capacity of mindfulness across the population. And by capacity, I mean the ability to pay attention on purpose um, to the present moment, uh, as, 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 I, as I mentioned. And if we imagine that scenario, then we can work through what would the implications of this be um, for the economy as a whole? We, there's lots written about how this might affect individual businesses and and of course, individuals and their lives, but thinking about the economy as a whole, we could start with the supply side of the economy. So essentially, um, we could look at it through the lens of productivity. And there's three things uh, we could look at here. And the first and the most obvious is the potential for mindfulness training to help to treat mental illness. Um, this is uh, the leading cause of absenteeism in the UK, accounting for I think around 70 million sick days per year. 
Um, so even purely from a narrow interest in productivity, and of course our interests here are much broader in terms of well-being, but even from a productivity lens, this could be really important. Um, but as well as that, I mean, the, the all-party parliamentary group on um, economic well-being recently had a report out where they singled out dealing with mental illness and the crisis of mental health as the single most important challenge for economic policymakers to address going forward. Then the second channel, if you like, through which an uplift in the aggregate level of mindfulness across the population could support the economy is on average through our ability to focus. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence that mindfulness training can boost our attentional control. And this includes um, reducing the effort required for us to filter out distractions. And, you know, in the attention economy, in the kind of smartphone era, I think this idea of um, taking seriously something like a notion of attentional capital, that is, you know, our attentional capabilities as they support us to uh, to be productive, um, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think it's important not only because at this time it could be quite significant the amount of uh, time that, say, workers are spending, you know, distracted on social media or you know, online shopping or whatever we do when we maybe should be working. Um, of course, that will directly um, have an impact on productivity. But as well as that, it's also about the the habits that we're cultivating here. So, for instance, if we're regularly distracted or if we tend to work through a kind of continuous partial attention uh, frame where we're kind of flitting from our inboxes to instant messenger to something else we're checking online and so on, then in theory, this can really erode um, our capacity to focus, not just today, but the habits that we're cultivating for our ability to pay attention um, over the longer term. And there's a quote I heard recently from the neuroscientist, Richie Davidson, um, jokingly, but I think he, he made a point here that the national attention deficit far exceeds the national fiscal de deficit at this point in time. And then the third way that I think an uplift in aggregate levels of mindfulness could support our uh, productivity is in the context of um, the range of technological advances like AI and, 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 and so on, which require us to differentiate our human skill set from um, increasingly capable uh, technologies. And you know, one way that we can differentiate our skill set is through empathy. And this is, um, you know, on some measures, it's there's worrying declines in measures of empathy among young people, particularly at precisely the time when we really need, I, th I think, our empathy to go up. But there's, um, in any case, studies which link mindfulness to the cultivation of empathy. And another, um, another contender here for our kind of inherently human capabilities is our capacity for creative thinking. So um, there's, a, there's a few ways of measuring this. There's lateral thinking, which is um, essentially our ability to, to solve problems by thinking outside the box. There's divergent thinking, which is essentially experiments where you, you ask people, um, you, give, you take an object like a, a kitchen utensil and you ask them how to list how many different things this could be used for. Which if you think about it, it's quite a strange question, but it's getting to that idea of um, how to think widely, openly, and, and creatively. And perhaps a bit more uh, safe territory for, for economists to engage with, there's, there's also studies linking mindfulness to a reduction in certain cognitive biases in our decision-making. So, for instance, to reduce the, the sunk cost bias, which is when we're on a given um, course of action and then new information comes in that suggests that we should change our course of action, but there's a tends to be a, um, a cognitive bias where we stick to plan A and, and instead of actually moving to the better option. And mindfulness um, seems to be connected with a reduction in, in that bias there. So on the kind of surface level, each of these through mental health, through uh, attention, through empathy and creativity, each of these support support productivity in the kind of narrow sense. But of course they're also 
each of them so much more than that. And they really, I think, speak to capacities that we need um, for a more a healthier and more adaptable economy, perhaps at a time when um, yesterday's solutions are a fairly poor fit for today's set of problems. So Dan, what about, so what about the other side to this? What about how much we consume? Yeah, so I think actually this is where it gets really interesting when, when we think about um, economic demand and, and the aggregate amount of consumption going on. And I guess the first thing to say is that there's um, reasons to believe and, and, and evidence to support that uh, practicing mindfulness and cultivating the capacity to be mindful is associated with more sustainable patterns of consumption and more ethical decision making in, in some cases. Um, so you might expect to see maybe a shift in what gets consumed that moves a little bit away from things like fast fashion and impulse buys, say, um, to, to more sustainable patterns of consumer behavior. But I think beyond that, um, you might also expect an overall reduction in the rate of consumption growth. So this means overall in the economy, lower consumption growth, and, and, and probably with that, lower overall GDP growth. And that's, in a sense, a much bolder claim. And I'm certainly, it's not one that I'm um, absolutely certain about. But the reason for thinking that this could come about is that core to mindfulness practice is cultivating the ability to see thoughts as thoughts or to see, say, emotions as emotions. And so if you, and, and this is termed uh, metacognition um, by, by psychologists studying this. And so when it comes to our desires um, or our urges to, to buy something, to consume something, um, that capacity for metacognition, just to notice the desire rather than being overly kind of caught up in it, um, what it means is, is it doesn't mean that we have less desires. Um, desires will still bub bubble up as they always will. But there's a, a pause, that, but there's, a, there's a, a space that opens up between stimulus and response that by bringing awareness to the bubbling up of our desires and other thoughts and emotions that we're paying attention to through mindfulness, that we um, have greater freedom in how we respond to those desires. And there's then the next step of, of the argument is that, you know, we might expect overall that people might consume a little bit less and be more content with, with what they have. And some support for that is, um, I think, provided from some studies. I mean, Kirk, Kirk Warren Brown of Virginia Commonwealth University in America and colleagues, they looked at the gap between um, the, the desired financial states that people would ideally be in, so people's um, ideal scenarios, or at least, let's say, desired scenarios for their finances, and the gap between that and where they currently are. And they found that individuals who practice mindfulness report a lower gap between where they are now and where they'd ideally like to be. And um, kind of hand in hand with that, that they reported a, a higher subjective well-being. So I think that gives some indication that you might expect something like um, a greater sense of having enough with what we already have as an outcome um, of mindfulness. Now, um, this might seem somewhat paradoxical to, to say that mindfulness could benefit the economy as a whole, and it would do so in part through reining in our consumption behaviors. And certainly that is a very you know, unconventional position to take. But I think this is coming back to where I mentioned context at the beginning, and in particular, the environmental context that we find ourselves in. I think that, um, you know, our consumption behavior is, is, directly, um, uh, is directly related to, to the extent of global warming and, and, and other things which are um, harmful for our environment, including pollution and the rate of, uh, you know, loss of biodiversity and so on. And so we have to see our economic strategy within that environmental context. Now, the conventional response to that is, okay, so we can work with our usual growth model, the idea being that, you know, all else equal, higher consumption per, per capita is going to be good for the individual's living standards, that we can work with that and just maybe shift towards maybe more ideas for green growth and maybe also widen our measure of well-being to include 
other things such as uh, the quality of our relationships, the time that we spend in nature and, and so on. Um, and I guess my thinking is, is an, an informed through what light that mindfulness and awareness sheds on, on the situation here is that we can go a little bit further than just having the growth model and widening it out a bit by throwing in other ingredients of well-being. That instead we can maybe think that this idea of consumerism, that more is better for the individual, um, of course, beyond a certain point in, in income, what I mean is um, for people whose basic needs or even more than the basic needs, but for a certain level of income, absolutely um, up to that point, material needs will need to be met before um, well-being can be improved upon. But to hold to the growth model for everyone, wherever their starting point and looking ahead for the coming decades, just as a kind of as a basic uh, guiding principle for our economic plan. To me, I think that can be scrutinized a bit more deeply. Um, and, you know, I'll just end with uh, an anecdote that I was um, speaking alongside Satish Kumar recently, the um, British Indian environmentalist and activist in what he's into his 80s now, I think. And he was telling me that he recently went to the London School of Economics and he was talking about um, ecology. And he asked them, the students there, could you point me to your department of ecology? And of course, the LSE it doesn't, doesn't have one. It majors really on economics. And, and he said, well, you know, if you th think about economy, the word means uh, management of the home, of, of the, you know, the ingoings and outgoings that make our home what it is. And he said that ecology means knowledge of the home. It's knowledge of our home environment and habitat. And he said, you know, you can't have you can't properly study management of the home without the context there of, of the wider knowledge, the environmental um, context for the home. Uh, I thought that was a neat way of, sort of framing it, which is also how I see um, mindfulness fitting in here is it's, I think, a way to help us context contextualize um, the, the consumerist basis of, uh, of, of, of our economic thinking in a wider environmental context. So you've talked in your writing about the idea of mindfulness and the individual and in particular how mindfulness gives us a broader view um, beyond ourselves. Can you just expand on that a little? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, you can think of this in a way as the third way, the third aspect in which we could think about mindfulness as, as foundational. So firstly, it's paying attention on purpose and the agency that comes from that. And secondly is, as we've just discussed, the um, connecting to other people aspect. But there's also, I think, an issue more generally around widening our perspective, um, which is really afforded through the cultivation of mindfulness practice, about opening up to the possibilities of how we see our situations. And so what, what do I mean by that? I mean... To start with, we so often live through the filter of our pre-held beliefs and conceptions about things and so on, um, as you know, as we live live our lives. And that's absolutely natural and helps us in many ways um, to get things done. But one thing which mindfulness really helps us to do is to step back and really be in receptive mode. So to the whole range of our experience. So for instance, not only the thoughts and feelings that are going on, but also, as I've said, what's going on in the body um, and really being perceptive and attentive to what's going on around us. So there's this, this sense of stepping back and slowing down, if you like, which comes with an openness and in particular, um, a curiosity to what's here what's here before us moment to moment. And this attitude of curiosity, or it's sometimes called a, a spirit of questioning, it's, it's a questioning where we're not necessarily looking for the answer. In fact, we're not looking for answers. We're really just open to possibilities. And um, with this comes, you could think of it as one, one consequence of that is holding a bit less tightly to my view and you know, my opinion on something. And, and there's a lot of feedback from um, various 
populations who've been through mindfulness-based programs around becoming more open to different perspectives and um, really uh, widening my perspective on things and seeing other people's points of view. And, and this links in, of course, to the um, link between mindfulness and empathy that we talked about. And so I think there's quite an important point here around gaining a wider perspective uh, or seeing the bigger picture, if you like. And one slightly more concrete way to to, to, to think about what this means in terms of the outcomes is there's a range of studies which do seem to link practicing mindfulness with um, improvements in our creative thinking. So one example of that would be studies around what they call lateral thinking, which is our ability to solve problems that require us to overcome our more automatic or habitual um, patterns of thinking, if you like, to think outside the box. Um, and arguably, you know, with the, the global and really quite fundamental challenges that societies and individuals, of course, are dealing with at this point in time, you know, there's that, I think, old mantra that, you know, about when yesterday's solutions are a bad fit for today's problems, that that's when you most need um, to think outside the box. So there's maybe a sense that being able to um, boost our creative thinking and, and, and see things in a wider perspective. Is, is particularly valuable at this point in time. And I guess I just add on to this, you know, by heralding, if you like, mindfulness as this foundational human capacity, I want to be really clear that I'm not saying that mindfulness is a panacea. Um, and, you know, in terms of the scientific support for, 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 for these different aspects of our human functioning, in some respects, it's fairly robust, particularly in a lot of the mental health contexts. And in other areas, I think including empathy and, and some of this thinking that I've mentioned, it's definitely true that, you know, more studies and more robustness in these studies is required. So I'm not presenting this um, as absolutely a definitive thing, but I think there's increasing uh, areas in which mindfulness really does seem to be able to support us in this really foundational capacity. So Dan, to bring all of this together, um, from raising awareness to the application of mindfulness in society. I'm interested to know, what do you think the overall impact would be? So, thanks. So I think the first thing I'd say um, is, I'd start with humility around, you know, uh, predictions that I've, I've alluded to here and, and, and the evidence around what the economic impact would be. And I say that um, because... A lot of the emergent science of mindfulness and, and the range of um, aspects of human functioning, which it seems to impact, um, it is still early days. So, um, and, and certainly to develop this in an economic framework, it's very, very early days. Um, but to sum up on what I've said so far, I guess if we're looking at what would the sum uh, kind of outcome, if you like, be at the macroeconomic level, well, you might see slightly higher productivity as a result of increased um, cultivation of awareness or mindfulness, um, but importantly, higher productivity in ways which help us adapt to uh, the age of technological change and innovation that's going on around us. At the same time, we might see slightly lower consumption growth overall, but again, it's important in how that's happening, and I think it's happening in ways which place our economic situation uh, a bit more clearly within the environmental setting, both from an individual consumer's point of view, but maybe as we look at the economy more holistically in that sense as well. And then in order to have uh, lower consumption overall and lower GDP growth overall, yet with, if anything, slightly higher productivity, you'd also see, to reconcile those two things, you'd see that people on average would be choosing to work a little bit less. They'd be a little bit more productive in the hours spent working, but they'd need to consume less week to week, month to month overall, you know, at the margin. So you'd see um, people choosing to work less across the economy as a whole. And so that's the sort of macro view. I guess the other thing to say, though, is that in a sense, what um, I think what the issue of mindfulness can, can um, shed light on is, is also the picture of the human being that we place at the center of our economic models. And again, Jeffrey Sachs is someone who's, who's talked about the need for what he calls a new, a new economic anthropology. 
And thinking about awareness and empathy and creativity, I guess there's a general sense here in terms of how mindfulness could fit in that um, I wonder if economists and, and thinkers generally can use our imagination to work towards a less algorithmic picture of the human being at the center of economic models. So one which um, places things like attention, uh, things like empathy, things like our very capacity to change over time. So our neuroplasticity, if you think of it at the kind of level of how the brain changes, which it does through things like mindfulness practice. Um, whether all of these things might help to build uh, a more human center for economic thinking in, 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 in the years to come. One of the key themes that you've written about, Dan, that was really intriguing is the idea of intention as experience. So for starters, I wonder if you just explain what that is and afterwards explain whether we're in danger as a society of losing that as our intentionality is eroded over time as we become increasingly digitized. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad you asked this because it puts me on a, quite a different uh, tack from, from what I've just been saying in, 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 a, in, I think, an important way. So um, if we step back and if we think about this narrative of the attention economy uh, that's become very popular recently. And the basic idea then is our attention is limited and there's so many competing claims for our attention. And we need to be uh, conscious of the fact that if we don't use our attention for our own purposes, then other actors out there or just the general, you know, kind of uh, deluge of um, sort of tweets and other things will will grab our attention and, and so we need to be active in using our attention ourselves and so and that's all fine and I think it's a really really important critique which I uh, subscribe to but what's embedded in in that um, in that account is an idea of our attention as a resource and and of course this absolutely runs through pretty much everything I've just been saying if we link um, attention to economic outcomes, and certainly when it comes to our productivity and creativity, I'm, I'm myself absolutely guilty there of, in, of treating attention as a resource. But that idea of attention as a resource is also um, very limiting, and it's important to appreciate that. And so this a counter to attention as a resource is this idea of attention as experience. And what I mean by that is the way that our attending is really what fundamentally connects us to the world around us and, and allows us to explore the world. And so to give kind of um, examples of this, if we think about how we attend to conversation with other people or how we attend to art or to music or to nature, um, anything which requires intimacy, um, an appreciation, then in each of those in each of those cases, we're going to we're not going to do very well if we attend in an instrumental way of I'm using my attention as a resource and and so on. So uh, William James, writing in 1890, has this quote that our life experience will equal what we have paid attention to, and I think that. That's absolutely right. And, it, you know, what he's pointing to here, that attention is really, really fundamental to our reality. It's a really deep idea from a philosophical basis. And so if we always paid attention as a means to an end, um, using attention as a resource, then I don't think we'd have a very fulfilling life at all relative to this alternative of, let's say, you know, ballpark half of the time, um, treating attention as experience, simply as a, a means of exploring things. So to be clear then on what I see as the issue here, I think the danger is um, in, in the attention economy at the moment is twofold. The first issue is that the forces of the attention economy mean that we are indeed less intentional with how we uh, direct our attention because, you know, we pick up our phones, uh, you know, at the bus stop to check the weather but then we just find ourselves mindlessly scrolling through content and and that's not good in terms of using our attention um 
in ways which support our goals um, rather than other people's maybe. So that's the attention economy problem. But the second issue is that precisely that attention economy framing serves to exacerbate um, thinking about attention as a resource. And so if we think about, say, um, you know, the limit case where attention really is considered by everyone all the time as a resource, I feel that that links in somewhat with kind of the sort of life hacking or self-optimization mindset uh, taken to extremes. So maybe there's some indication of this with, you know, the quantified self movement that, you know, things are only... Um, only things that can be measured and seen, you know, through data are going to be the things which uh, are meaningful for us. And the American um, social critic Jonathan Bella has this essay on paying attention in which he sort of imagines this dystopian future in which, you know, life hacking goes to extreme and quantified self um, scenarios play out in which he says that humanity becomes its own ghost. And I think there's something there that um, just points then to the need to absolutely think about the attention economy and the forces grabbing our attention and using our attention wisely, but also remembering to treat our attention, perhaps primarily and first of all, as what connects us with reality, as experience itself, and um, before we treat it, or as well as treating it as something which is instrumental to be used. So Dan, it's been fantastic listening to your perspective on all of this. Where is the best place for people to connect with you and to find out more about your work? Sure. So I think LinkedIn is is the best place. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm really happy to engage with uh, anyone listening who who's interested to take this conversation on attention further forward. So that's probably the best place to find you. Well, Dan, thank you so much again for being here with us here on the show today. It's been a pleasure to have you on and I wish you all the very best with your writing. Thank you very much, Lawrence. It's been fantastic to be here and and to talk with you.